Global climate talks in Madrid ended yesterday with little agreement on addressing what many say is the single greatest challenge facing humanity. William Brangham has more on why the talks failed to achieve nearly any of its stated goals. That's right, Judy. These marathon talks ended with a small compromise and an enormous disappointment. The annual gathering, known as COP, ended 14 days of talks where the biggest polluting nations were unwilling or unable to agree on stronger plans to curb their emissions, the very things that are dangerously warming this planet. They also postponed a decision on carbon markets, which are considered a key tool for trying to slow down climate change. Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, expressed the feelings of many. We are not on track. Emissions are still growing. Mm. So the reality mm. is still nothing comparable with the commitments that we hope will be made. Mm. The reality is that emissions are growing, we reached uh, uh, record levels of concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, corresponding only to what we had millions and millions of years ago. For more on this diplomatic failure, I'm joined now by Helen Mountford. She's vice president for climate and economics at the World Resources Institute, and she is just back from Madrid. Welcome to the News Hour. Thank you. I know that this conference was not the be all and end all climate conference. But the evidence is growing more and more that climate change is a real and growing threat. There are tens of thousands of kids all over the world protesting our inaction, and yet world leaders just cannot seem to come to terms. Can you just help us understand what happened in Madrid? Thanks very much. I think it's exactly as you say, there is a huge disconnect between what we're seeing on the ground with the kids, the protesters saying we need more climate action. The science is clearer than ever. We need to step up and do more. And what happened in the negotiation halls where mostly the negotiators are moving at a snail's pace. There was a lot of brinkmanship. We saw real leadership from some of the smaller and medium sized economies, particularly those most vulnerable to climate, climate impacts. They really stood up and tried to push as hard as possible possible to move forward to advance work, but it was the major emitters who were largely either absent or obstructionist. Is some of the obstructionist or, or negligence, whatever you want to call it, is some of that shorter term economic thinking? Because we know elections are won in the here and now, and many leaders look at the state of their economy as crucial. Mm -hmm. And still, despite what we see every day, some people think climate change is going to affect the next president or the next president. Is that some of what's going on here? I think there's definitely some short-termism and some uh, basically very much focused on their own interests, uh, each trying to get the best that they could out of the deal. Um, but the reality is we know now that the economics are better than ever in terms of climate action. When the Paris Accord was, uh, was agreed uh, four years ago, um, since then what we've actually seen is the costs of renewables have plummeted. We have new technologies that are available on electric vehicles or battery storage, which have really opened up possibilities. We know that President Trump has pledged that he's going to formally pull out of the Paris Climate Accords. What do you make of the argument that some people say that in the absence of strong U.S. leadership at the table, that this is the natural thing that's going to happen, which is the other major emitters say, if the U.S. is not there, neither are we. Well, I think that is partly what we're seeing, but what we're, what we're also starting to see is some of the other major emitters are starting to step up and say, okay, in the absence of the U.S. at the table, we really need to do a little bit more um, and we need to show that leadership. So I'd particularly highlight the European Union. Uh, last week, they agreed that they're going to go to net zero emissions of carbon by 2050. I mean, that's a huge step. It's a huge step. It's really important. We've seen those sorts of commitments from some of the smaller, medium-sized economies, particularly the developing countries that are vulnerable to climate change. But that's the first major emitter that said that. Canada has also said that they want to go that way and they need parliamentary approval, but they're planning to go. So I think we're starting to see some of the other major emitters step up to the plate, um, but it wasn't really in time for these negotiations. Still missing from that list of the major emitters, though, is China, the elephant in the room, the rising emitter in the room, and India. What are those nations doing? 
Well, they're actually doing quite a bit domestically, but I think they are looking to the more developed economies and saying, look, we expect you to stand up first and we expect you to move Because forward. you put the vast majority of greenhouse gases up in the atmosphere and now you're saying, as we're starting to grow, hold off on your economy. Right. That's, uh, that's exactly right. They're starting to say, well, we want to see you taking action before we do so as well. Um, I think they are starting to move, but we do need some more leadership from other major economies to start forward. There was also some disagreement on this whole issue of how to set up the carbon markets. Yes. The idea being put a tax on carbon, make everybody pay for emitting that carbon, and then countries can buy and sell uh, credits to, to emit different amounts. What happened in that regard? So that's right. I mean, this was really about the international carbon markets, how countries can collaborate together, which in, in, if it's done well, will actually lead to more ambitious uh, climate action, cheaper climate action, um, and more collaboration. If it's done poorly, it actually could lead to more emissions rather than less. Um, and I think the risk that we saw there was as they were starting to set up the rules for how to do these international carbon markets, a number of countries uh, were pushing forward and trying to sort of add in loop poles, which would actually lead to more emissions rather than less. Um, and so in the end of the day, other countries stood up and said, look, we are not willing to accept carbon market rules, which are actually going to jeopardize the Paris Agreement. A lot of pressure on coming next year's conference. Absolutely. Helen Mountford, thank you very much for being here. Thank you.